Okay, so yeah, so if we try to do this one, right? This is where we're going next. If we try to solve this, this uses the stuff from section 4.4, doesn't it, right? We can point to a single x so we can isolate it. it what would the steps be to solve for x? You add 5. Okay, so we add 5. So that's going to give us negative 2x squared equals 18. Divide by negative 2. Divide by negative 2, and I get x squared equals negative, negative 9. 9. The answer is no real number. Okay, but I didn't say it had to be a real number. Never oh. said that, did I? Right? I just wanted the solutions to this. I didn't specify that they had to be real solutions. Okay? So, there is a solution. There are two solutions to this. If I square root both sides, I get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 9. And the negative part is what's messing me up, right? Yeah. Because we've always said you can't take a square root of a negative number. Well, you can. You can take a square root of a negative number, but if you do, you just don't get a real result. You get a different kind of number. Let's talk about that. So your solution is going to look like plus or minus. Let's go ahead and use a property of radicals. So the square root of a times b, I could write as the square root of a times the square root of b. That's true. Everybody accept that? Yep. I mean, we can do something like, we've done that many times when we simplify radicals, right? So the square root of negative 9, we could write as plus or minus the square root of negative 1 times square root of 9, right? Square root of 9, we know that's just 3, okay? But what's the square root of negative 1? The square root of negative 1 is what we define as the imaginary unit, i. That's our definition, okay? So the square root of negative 1 we call i, and so our answer then ends up looking like two answers, plus or minus 3 i. Okay? That probably seems weird, but it's a perfectly valid number. It's just not a number that is used. It's just not a number that is a cardinal number. It's not a number that's used in any type of cardinality, it means we're counting stuff. You guys are used to using real numbers. Well, real numbers are good at counting things. Like if we want to talk about the number of eggs in a in a dozen eggs, well, that number 12 works. 12 is a real number. Okay? Most of the math that you've ever done is honestly just about organizing and reorganizing groups of counting numbers. If you multiply two numbers, what are you doing? If I multiply 7 times 8, I've got 7 groups of 8. So I come up with the number 56 because that's the cardinality of that product. That's, how, that's what, how many different items that represents, right? And we can even represent portions of objects or fractions of objects, or even square roots of objects, right? This is just as good a number. In fact, in some ways, better. It's just not for counting stuff. It's a different kind of number. Okay? It's we, the, the term imaginary is really unfortunate. I mean, here we throw these, these modifiers of these numbers, and we say one of them is a real number, and one of them is an imaginary number. Well, doesn't that sort of give the implication that real numbers are solid, useful things? And imaginary numbers are these ethereal, you know, abstract things that are, you know, we, well, why do we talk about those? Are imag what the heck's an imaginary number? It's a bad name because imaginary numbers are just as useful. In fact, I'd say they're, in many, many cases, they're more useful than real numbers. Like a lot of the stuff that you do in physics, and I'm going to give you some examples here, not today, but on, on Monday we'll look at more of this. We'll actually start to look at some applications of, of some engineering stuff, some physics stuff, where Imaginary numbers make life so much easier than real numbers. Much of what you do in physics and electrical engineering involves using these imaginary numbers all the time. Yep. Is an imaginary number is any Well, but isn't well okay, you tell me what's what's the number five mean? Uh that's five is just a concept that we've adopted to try to represent Five is nothing. Five is completely abstract, right? I mean, it's so I, I get what you're saying. We're able to more strongly attach a vision of what five means to us to the number five, but five is five is a completely 
leave the abstract there. Right? Yeah, or I guess my question is what? If you have to like any time you have to be working with something like the theory that would you be using that? Well, I, I mean, sure, but let's say you wanted to, for example, I'll give you a couple quick examples. We're about out of time anyway. So let's say you wanted to do an arrangement of lenses. If you, wanted, if, if you were to disassemble, disassemble a, a, a telephoto lens, what you'd see is a bunch of lens elements. When you twist the telephoto lens and you zoom in and out, there's a really complicated physical network in there that's going to push these lenses around. It's hard to build. So that they, they move in concert, but if you wanted to make some calculations about the focal point of those lenses or the uh, any of the of the lens parameters we'd use when we're, when we're talking about imaging stuff with a lens, you'd find that those were very difficult calculations. You'd have to take into account every lens in the system to make the overall calculation. The object of one lens becomes the image, or the image of one lens becomes the object of another lens, and you go through and through and through. Unless you build a, 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 using these numbers, these imaginary numbers, you could build the equivalent of one single lens that incorporates all of that stuff. But to do that, you'd have to use these imaginary numbers. But that's pretty cool. That enables you to treat them all as one complicated lens if you use So that's pretty tangible and pretty useful, right? I mean, it does some things like that, too. OK, we'll talk more about it next week. Have a good weekend. You betcha.